Sports Business Time with John Skipper, the president and CEO of Metal Arc Media, and with David Sampson, the host of Nothing Personal and the former president of the Miami Marlins. The audience really seems to enjoy the insight from these two gentlemen. And if the prep meeting is any indication, we are on fire today. We got a lot to discuss. And David, I want to first begin with you on what's going on with Daniel Snyder, the steel owner of the Washington Commanders. There was a bombshell report on Tuesday from Don Van Nata about a loan that Daniel Snyder took out and his relationship with his limited partners. Can you give us some insight on what the story entails and ultimately what the relationship between Snyder and his minority owners was? So Daniel Snyder, we say he owns the Washington Commanders. He's actually the general partner of a partnership that owns 100% of the Washington Commanders. He was not the sole owner of the team. He had a bunch of partners. And your job as a general partner is to take care of the underlying asset of the partnership. Run the team. Don't breach your fiduciary duty. It doesn't say anything about winning games. What it says is don't steal our money. Spend it wisely. And I don't mean on linebackers. Don't spend it to un unjustly enrich yourself in things that are not part of the business of the partnership. It turns out that the partners, one of them from FedEx, those three guys who were trying to get out of the commanders and eventually sold their shares back to Daniel Snyder, they are alleging that he took money without them knowing. He borrowed money as a company, which added debt to a company that he didn't get permission to do, and that the NFL rubber stamped it, including Roger Goodell, and that the money was not used for any good purpose other than for himself. There's a lot more to this story, but what's interesting for our show is where are they now? And where are they now is that Daniel Snyder owns the shares of these partners who sold because Goodell told them to sell to Snyder. And now the team is worth twice what it was a year and a half ago when they sold the shares and those guys don't suffer fools gladly and they're pissed. So those minority owners are seeing stakes of $6.3 billion, $7 billion being thrown out there. They sold that evaluation of far less than that less than two years ago. So what is their recourse here? Hold on. Let me wait for it. Wait, wait. There, there, no, no, can't think of any. Zero. They sold their shares and they, here's the great thing about a, a purchase sale agreement. When you buy out your partners, you get full indemnification and release which means you cannot sue at all on anything related to the transaction. Could they go into a court of law and say that they were fraudulently induced to enter into a contract? Good luck with that. Yeah, but to be uh, fair, David, first of all, I'm stunned a little bit, Chris, when you suggested there's an audience for this show. I, I never realized we were doing anything <laughs> other than talking in a studio to ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to be a little bit more careful, maybe, about what I say. Uh, first the, 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 the pay-per-view Super Bowl idea might, might I feel like that was received by some people as if we were just talking about this in a room. Okay. I, I, I happen to think it's a good idea, but I, I've, I've heard that idea panned by a few. It, You're a visionary, a, John. You do it's know a, that you run a company that's based on people actually listening to the things <laughs> that are said by you and others, right? Yeah, yeah, but generally I employ people who are good at this uh, <laughs> as opposed to getting on and talking to myself. Despite that, I would suggest a couple of things. One is, uh, why would anybody be surprised at any abominable behavior from the owner of the Washington Commanders at this point? Second, while I have some level of, I guess, sympathy for guys who only got $875 million, uh, team values are going up at this sort of astronomical rate. And I suspect we could find other examples of teams that sold, maybe not in this stratosphere, but sold for $38 million, and two years later, they're sold for $603 million. The L.A. Football Club, I believe, in MLS is now valued at a billion dollars. Somebody who sold the club two or three years ago, a minority stake, would have sold it at a valuation of three or $400 million. Life's Life is timing, right? There's, there's athletes or there's broadcasters who were really good 30 years ago who didn't make Tony Romo money, right? Yep. And so that's just the way it goes. There's baseball players who stink, who get paid more than the MVPs of yesteryear. And in the NBA, you've got a bunch of guys making tens of millions of dollars who, you know, when you look at what Michael Jordan's career earnings were, it would blow your mind. And it's funny, the reason you get grumpy retired athletes are those who don't want to face the facts that their timing just wasn't great. 
And that is the case when you're selling part of a team. But the reason this is getting so much attention, gentlemen, is that Roger Goodell is being implicated here because he manufactured this. The partners wanted to sue Daniel Snyder. It goes to arbitration in front of the commissioner. That's the rule inside these partnership agreements if there's a dispute. Then the commissioner said, instead of an arbitrator, why don't we mediate? And that means they get into a room for two days and they find a way to get to a price where the partners go away and say, we're never coming back and we're never suing. Now the partners are saying, but man, Goodell, you knew about what was going on with Daniel Snyder. You were aware that he was totally screwing us and you still let us do it. So Roger Goodell is getting, getting some heat here from this ESPN story, which of course is interesting because ESPN is a partner to the NFL, a significant partner. And those journalistic relationships we've chronicled uh, a fair bit. But uh, the other juicy bits on this Snyder story, and uh, we're going to get to the RSN story, which you contend, David, is a bigger sports business story. But I think because of the personalities and the entity involved, uh, it, it this commander story, I think, probably leads from a news judgment standpoint uh, from Daniel Snyder and his relationship or lack thereof with Jeff Bezos. So the reporting out there is that the first round of bids reached $6.3 billion. Daniel Snyder won $7 billion, but he is also, the uh, Bank of America has suggested, uh, not selling to Jeff Bezos. And he will not do that uh, over the course of this sale process because of his personal distaste for the man. What do you make of the fact that personal distaste might cost himself money? And ultimately, how will the own, the other owners receive that? that he is not going to take the maximum price available potentially. Well, it certainly puts the F and FU money, doesn't it? <laughs> if you're able to, to turn down 7 billion to take 6.3, that's quite the flex. And just the background is Bezos owns the Washington Post. Washington Post broke the story on all the shenanigans and how do you say it, John? The abominable behavior of the Washington commander's owner really came to light from the Washington Post. And so Dan Snyder said, you know, forget, it, I'm not gonna sell to you. Roger Goodell does, let's say two things first. You can sell your asset to whoever you want. Hard stop. He doesn't have to sell to Bezos. He can sell the team for a billion dollars if that's his choice. No problem. As long as he is not breaching his fiduciary duty to his partners because you have a duty to maximize the value of your asset. But he already bought out those other guys. So he owns it. He can he, do whatever he, he wants. He doesn't have a fiduciary duty to the NFL? Great question. It is nowhere in the documents. You sign an agreement with Major League Baseball or the NFL when you buy into a team. There is nowhere written that you have a duty to maximize the value of your asset upon the sale of said asset. Yeah. If Daniel Snyder had a sense of humor, he would make Jeff Bezos an offer that if he ordered within the next four hours, they would deliver the team to him for seven and a half billion dollars and the shipping would be free. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> it would get there within 36 hours or whichever prime day you select. Uh, but David, uh, in terms of the other owners here, because I mean, it has been floated that Daniel Snyder at the end of all this will not sell the team. And it has been floated as well that Daniel Snyder is seeking that similar indemnification, if I'm using that word correctly, uh, against further lawsuits from the NFL should anything happen. And that has not been received very well. What do you think would be the status of an owner who is this much of a pariah within the club? So a couple things, the indemnification issue is a pretty technical issue, but to make it easy, when you buy into a team or when you sell a team, you, are, you sign a piece of paper that's pretty long and well negotiated. And it says that if the league ever gets sued because of something you do, you will cover the costs that the league <laughs> incurs in defending itself. That's number one. Number two, if you ever get sued, you cannot bring the league into it. You can't involve them, you cannot join them, you can't ask them for help, nothing. Basically, the league puts all the owners on an island. And if there is someone who sues both of you, the league and the team, the team indemnifies the league where if the league ends up doing something wrong, the team actually pays for what the league did. It's totally insane, but this is what owners do. And so what Dan Snyder is trying to do is an opposite. He's trying to get the league to indemnify him that if he gets sued for anything he has done wrong in the past, that the league will cover him. And there's no way the league is going to do that in a million gajillion years. 
John, uh, we were discussing before the the way that the owners are protecting Daniel Snyder, and I was sort of asking the question, why why is the one being protected ahead of the 31 here? What are the internal politics from within a league of Daniel Snyder getting the protection? And basically, we kind of all came to the conclusion that once you're part of the club, everyone in the club gets equal and fair treatment. The 31 other owners care more about protecting the province of the club and you have to, and David understands this better than I do, if you attack the other owners financially, if you have done something, and Snyder has been accused of uh, misrepresenting some revenues that happened at his stadium as being other than associated with the NFL, that is the only tipping point, is that the other owners perceive harm. I think, David, you, you again, you understand that better than I do. No, I, I agree with you, John, and that's, that's a very important point here because – Goodell wants the team to be sold for as much money as possible, but even if it's sold for less money to a different buyer, he'll just leak out there that Bezos was ready to buy the team at seven or seven and a half, and that is what he hopes will raise the tide of the other franchise values that would have been firmly risen if the team had actually sold for that seven or 7.3. But at the end of the day, they want Dan Snyder out. Dan Snyder is going to sell. There are rumors that he won't, but don't mistake the Glazers and Dan Snyder. The Glazers for spite could hold on to Man U, and I believe that. Dan Snyder does not have the ability to hold on to the commanders because there will come a time where 24 owners will stand up and they will vote him out. And if they do that, that creates a bigger problem for Dan than he wants. Let's move now to what, uh, David, you have called the biggest sports business story of the year. And I actually think that might be underselling it because I think this might branch out into an area of just business because it seems like an entire industry is collapsing in front of our eyes, that being the regional sports network industry. So again, for those in the audience that might not know, uh, there are channels that you watch, uh, presumably as a sports fan, uh, where you watch your local team. So uh, in my case, I watch the Miami Marlins, the Miami Heat, uh, the Florida Panthers on a channel called Bally Sports Sun or Bally Sports Florida. Uh, there are people in Los Angeles that watch on the, the Lakers on Spectrum Sportsnet or I think it's Sportsnet LA. There are all these channels that are created just to broadcast the sporting events of local sports teams. They're called regional sports networks. And one of the companies that owns them, Diamond Sports, is in the midst of bankruptcy. Another, it was announced last week, uh, Warner, or it was reported last week, Warner Brothers Discovery owns the AT&T local sports channels uh, in, I believe it's Houston, I think Vegas has one, and then Pacific Northwest, there's one. They're AT&T uh, sports channels. They're also saying, we want out of this business. And so, John, from your perspective as a sports media, a former sports media executive and a current sports media executive, why do you think these are going away and what ultimately comes next here? They're going away because of the decline of pay television. Uh, when pay television would at, was at its height, they could afford a $4.99 uh, Miami sports regional network, which paid money to the Marlins and the Panthers and the Heat. Uh, as they're declining, one, they're reaching less of the market. And two, when the deals are coming up, they are negotiating lower rates. And lower rates are something that no owner wants to see. But I have a point of view that these are ultimately doomed uh, enterprises. The regional sports network will go, sports network business will go away. It will hold on for a long period of time in a few very big, large markets uh, where the owners of Yankees and Bulls and Lakers and Dodgers don't want to give up what they can st they can maintain for a few more years. But this, this business is over because as distribution moves to streaming, there's also no reason to have ge geographic blackouts, which have been a pain in the butt for broadcasters and fans for years and years, and those will eventually go away. How big is this business, what? John? How, how, like between and, and you can provide some insight as well, David, as you, you once got revenue from this business. How big is this industry? You asking me how big the industry is? It's no. a multiple, multiple billion dollar industry that a very reasonable company, I can't remember, maybe it was, was it Disney? I can't remember somebody who got involved in buying a whole bunch of them for a whole bunch of billions, but it's just escaping me now, just sort of, I'm trying not to say anything bad about anybody. But John, do you have any idea uh, what uh, the value of those uh, I can Fox refresh, Sports Networks were? I can refresh your memory. Okay. Disney paid somewhere in the 13 to $14 billion range, 
and that would have been in 2017. Uh, they were forced to sell it by regulatory uh, action. They sold it to Sinclair for, I think, 10 or $11 billion. Something like that, yes. So it declined about 20% pretty quickly. And I think they have written it down to close to nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the what was worth, call it 12 and a half to $13 billion in 17, is now worth close to zero. So just to, when you're reviewing and when you're going over all of the political contributions that are made, and are you so happy that you were forced to sell? And I'm saying you, and I shouldn't, with a small why. How happy is Disney that they were forced to sell that because it really saved their, their ears? Yeah, I don't think at the time uh, we, because I was there then and was uh, – uh, active in discussing that buy, uh, that acquisition, and believe that for some significant period of time, Disney was the only place that could continue to make that a good business for five to ten years. Do you think it could have? Do you think it would have? Yeah, I think they would still be still be a good business. Just as nobody can take ESPN off, nobody can take off these regional sports networks if it's attached to an ESPN bundle, which it's not officially. Can you imagine what we just said on this show? What we're saying is that there are companies out there who bundle networks together. Do you know what the equivalent is for the sports fans out there? It's when you sign Victor Victor Mesa and you give him 5.2, but you bring in Junior, give him a million. Turns out Junior's the prospect, not the main guy. But it's totally against baseball rules to allocate signing bonuses that way. And I can't imagine that anyone would find it great that networks are being bundled in a way to make carriers, cable companies, charge you the customer money for stuff that you don't want. And that was the whole purpose of the RSN is that non-baseball fans and non-sports fans were paying money, literally paying money so owners could sign players. That's what's happening. John, can I ask you, why is this a bad business? It's a bad business because it's never, because of the deterioration of the pay TV bundle. There was enough money in that bundle. That was a $115 billion business. So the fact that they were paying, you know, ten billion of that uh, to regional sports networks was okay because the margin was still 30, 35, 40 percent. So it worked. And by the way, I have one dif- disagreement with David. That is, it wasn't that people were being forced to pay for them. It was good business because sports is the thing that most holds the bundle together, and it still is holding the bundle together. There would be no bundle if ESPN decided to go full streaming. It would fall apart, and there would be 25 to 30 million uh, pay TV subscribers in this country. But now that Disney doesn't own the networks, uh, you have admitted that going towards streaming is the way to, that is what's going to be forced, and putting more live events behind paywalls is what's in our future. A la carte is what it's called. So, Having people actually pay for what they watch. Yeah, it, it's... It, of course, I used to use the metaphor of a uh, buffet, right, where you go in and you can get whatever you want. You can get shrimp and you can get uh, corned beef and you can get potatoes and macaroni and it all costs you $10. Uh, there were a certain number of people who came in and said, I just want macaroni. Can I just pay 75 cents for that? But the people who came to the buffet came for the meat. They came for steak and ham and pork chops and hot dogs and everything else was along for the ride. Nobody likes to think that, but everybody else was along for the ride that for, with the entree. All right, so, so, let, so, so can we discuss then the dynamics of the, I guess, in, in my mind, there are three options from, for, in terms of what happens now, in terms of how sports fans get uh, these channels, and ultimately what the future of this business is. Uh, the first would be it stays on a regional basis, and teams continue to try and pursue their own local revenue model and that would probably have to happen with what? A regional sports channel or, or a, a local TV station? Or I guess through the league's network, which ha- has been mooted as well, where like the MLB network will air the Marlins games in Miami. And you just put on the MLB network and it's on. And you can watch the Marlins in Miami on the MLB network. Is that any kind of model that would make any sense? 
not financially, not in the short term, and that's the big issue. I'm wondering whether CW is a is a possible bidder here. Because <laughs> Live Golf has gone so well. Well, we could get you could get the same deal right now for your regional sports network. They would put you on if you paid for the. Oh, they might even pay for the production. Look, if, what, what what would your local Fox station pay for? You know the Cardinals it, games in St. Louis. A dime. If if you were getting a dollar from your regional sports network. You have the chance to go to your local broadcaster. They'll probably pay you a dime instead of a dollar. If you want to start your own streaming service, you could probably get about a dime. Uh, can, by can we go back, John, yeah. a little bit, if you don't mind. Go back to when the Yankees and all sorts of teams were, it's called, it was called over the air. There were games on WPIX in New York. Yes. And their fans went crazy. Go back 20 years when games were going to cable. When they went from regular channels to cable, the fans lost their mind saying, I'm not going to pay to get a, to be a cable subscriber to watch my teams. Does anyone remember that or just me? I know. I, I remember uh, Whammy in Miami used to have the, the, the Marlins games. It was WAMI. I think it was Channel 39, which I think became a PAC station, which is now uh, an ION station. Like the, the kind of what I, I think are the UHF channels. Uh, had a lot of local games. And then when it all went to Fox Sports Florida, I was too young to sort of uh, be outraged about that. But I remember sort of the the shift around the mid-aughts is when I'd say that happened in full. And I don't think there was that much aggravation, David, because it was inexpensive. When it moved from PIX and went over to cable, you were paying 35 bucks, and you were getting 40 or 50 more channels. Most people, 90% of the people of the United States did it. Did they complain a little bit? Maybe. But they voted with their pocketbook that the pay TV bundle was worth it for a long time. So you sound like an executive. Uh, and believe me, I, I resemble that comment. <laughs> but that's not at all how it happened. What happened is that everyone was angry as can be, said they're not going to take it anymore. And then the money started rolling in because it turns out that the league's held out. The owners held out and said, you, you serious? You're not going to watch my games? All right, I triple dare you. And guess what? The Yes Network gets born. SNY, these networks get born this way. This is what's happening with streaming. People are kicking and screaming, but it's going to be normal here in a couple of years. So the, the change that you're talking about and why baseball owners and basketball owners are concerned is that there's a short-term revenue hit that is happening now when these local networks go bankrupt, the leagues are gonna figure out how to distribute the content to the people who want it, and there will become a way to evaluate how much consumers will be willing to pay for this product of live sports, and then the revenue will start ticking up again. But current day owners, they don't like having revenue go down, but unfortunately that's the reality, which is why baseball is going for a salary cap, even though they're pretending they're not, because you wanna tie salaries to revenue. So NBA is protected, NFL is protected if there are huge revenue hits by caps going down. MLB is not protected by that, which is why there's a lot of talk of owners going for a cap. Yeah, there, there is, of course, a sport that's already engaged in this model where all of their games are national. Now, they have less games in it than the other three major leagues, uh, and that is the NFL. Every NFL game is available nationally. I thought you were going to say the MLS. Or, well, or MLS, I should say. Well, the MLS is is going to that in a couple of days. Uh, they, the, they already have done. We had, we, had, we had opening weekend of MLS. So in opening weekend, they went to a model where all their games. And you could argue they're the fifth national uh, major league. The first and the fifth are now there. The second one to get there will be the NBA. Uh, they will go mostly national, I think. And they can do that because... They have stars, and people want to watch stars. It's less geographical. Baseball was the most valuable sport in a regional network because of the quantity of games and also because of the rabidity. It's a local sport. You know, the stadium, you, you go to the stadium 10, 12 times a year easily. Mm -hmm. uh, basketball is 41 times. It's much different. And, again, you have national stars. There's only 12 players uh, suited up for, for a roster. You can see them all. they got short pants on. Uh, they don't wear hat. They don't wear caps. You can see them. They're accessible. To me, it, to me, they have the easiest path towards recovering most of so, this revenue. So, so what me, does short pants have to do with revenue? 
uh, accessibility. I mean, NBA players are, are bigger stars because they're for the most part they're not wearing helmets and and or we, pants. We, we, we see yeah. them. We see their faces. Uh, uh, okay, okay, but let me. Okay, so so we clear. So the the first model we're saying is out. Local state, either local TV stations or a recreation of the mm. RSN model is probably out in terms of recreating revenue. It's out in terms of recreating revenue, it so, may not be out because there may be teams that have no other recourse. Right. So, so the second would be, and and this has been mooted, direct to consumer, where you take your your rights in house, you create a streaming service, you sell at a certain price. In an article in the Sports Business Journal written by John Orand, uh, he cited an NBA source saying that that would take uh, the this team's a regional revenue from about thirty five million, which they were getting from the regional sports network, to about eight million. But I guess my question would be, David, would that be a good investment in the longer term? That maybe it will be it will it'll be eight million next year, but it has the potential to grow because more people will come into the service. We tried that in baseball. It's actually a brilliant play to take that thirty five million and bring it in house. The team makes the eight million. The league through increased revenue sharing or some sort of borrowing where the league gets a pot of money, give that team the difference, give them a $27 million check, keep them whole while you're building the streaming business and building direct to consumer and owners don't have to take a current day hit. That is what I would do. And that is what baseball was trying to do back in the Bob Bowman days. And that's what baseball is gonna be doing now. When D Sinclair, one thing you said in the beginning, they have not officially declared bankruptcy, but they missed an interest payment. So they're in a 30 day cure period, which is gonna expire. And then they're gonna declare bankruptcy. Then baseball is gonna have to figure out where they stand in line as creditors. Will those deals get paid? Because baseball teams have not been paid their rights fees for this year yet. They start getting paid in April. So it's coming soon. And if those checks don't come in, Baseball is going to have a problem because owners de de deliver their payrolls based on getting all that revenue. So all of this is happening right now. It's a fascinating time in business and in sports business. And I believe that baseball needs to get ahead of it and they need to get everything in house, get the digital rights for every team they can, and then make the owners whole on an annual operating basis. Do you see, foresee, David, that it would ever get back to 35 for that team? 35 million? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I believe that it's going to increase at a decline at a at a declining rate, right? Right. Rights fees have just been skyrocketing. If you look at the graph, and they're going to go off a cliff, and then they're going to start rising again, and eventually you get back to where you were and you beat it because the live sports content is the greatest content there is. Its value has not decreased, but no one is able right now to figure out the best way to get people to engage with it. And in that scenario, would the game still be blacked out in uh, outer market? So I think you get rid of the blackouts yeah. because in this world of streaming, there is no more blackouts. You said something about blackouts before that interested me. You said broadcasters were unhappy with blackouts. I had the opposite experience negotiating with broadcasters. They demanded the blackouts. We did not want blackouts at ESPN. We were very unhappy with blackouts, particularly when you had to blackout the two teams whose games you were showing and show it to the rest of the country. It used to happen with midweek baseball for ESPN, right? Where yes. like there were, you'd put a game on ESPN, but you couldn't watch it on ESPN. You'd put a game on between uh, the Giants and the Astros, and you couldn't show it in Houston and San Francisco. That's because, so it's not, so your definition is just a little different. You're giving me the executive definition of a blackout. A fan's definition of a blackout is when they can't watch a game. Right, and and that, this happens a lot, Correct. particularly like in geographic kind of blurry areas where if you're a, a Florida Marlins fan but you live in Palm Beach County, uh, then like it, it could be you, you might not be able to get the games because it might be blacked out. You might have to get the MLB extra. And sometimes there's some cases where it is neither available on like a streaming platform because it's blacked out and it's not available on the local channel because it's blacked out. And so you end up just not being able to watch a game uh, because you are in this geographical blurry area. So we, we talked about the direct-to-consumer and we talked about local stations. John, you have an idea for a, perhaps a third solution, which you suggest would be to bring all of the rights together and sell it as a package to Apple, Amazon, ESPN Plus, somebody who would want to have a ton of product mm -hmm. but it, as part of their streaming service. How good of a model do you think this could be uh, as a solution? Look, I think that's a model of the future. I think what MLS did was the smartest deal they could do uh, and that that is the future. They will 
have the luxury of growing into that in a way that uh, it would be very difficult for NFL, MLB, NHL, or NBA to do. For MLS, it represents an increase. For other leagues, it would yes. represent a decrease. Yes. And it is the future, though. I do believe that you'll see Apple buy into more national packages of the games that previously existed on a regional sports network. They dip their water in baseball. Yeah. So Apple has has a deal where they're doing, what is it, Friday night games? So let's say their package is 20 games or 26 games or whatever it is. And what's interesting is that you used to need 150 games available to your local rights holder in baseball. And so there were 12 games that you could do that were exclusive nationally. Apple is making it so those games are only available on Apple. That's the only way they would pay Major League Baseball. This is an important point because if you had stood up at ESPN and said, I will only pay you if these games are only available on ESPN, at that time, baseball would have told you to pound sand. At this time, baseball told Apple no problem. Now, David, what would, we, we discussed sort of an impediment to this idea. So it would essentially be the teams that don't have regional sports network, they pull their rights together and they sell it to a streamer for a certain amount of money. Wouldn't the biggest problem be how they split the money? Well, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the entire game, isn't it? That's the whole issue between owners of large revenue teams and owners of small revenue teams across all sports. People who buy, here's the best example, the commanders, if you buy the commanders for $6.3 billion, do you wanna give revenue to Jerry Jones as an example, who bought the team 20 years ago for $200 million? When the price of entry into the mafia club is so different, splitting revenue, which you need to pay your debt service, the whole reason why Diamond couldn't pay the interest on their debt is they didn't have the revenue to pay back the money they owed just on interest that they owed to finance a deal. It's like when you can't pay your mortgage. Let's put it in very simple terms. If you can't pay your mortgage, eventually the bank is gonna own the house and you're in trouble, right? That's what going bankrupt is, where you try to get out of your debt by declaring bankruptcy. So for me, owners don't wanna share. That's the biggest fight that exists in owners' meetings is large market owners fighting with small market owners. Yeah. Do, do you remember, David, that when Sinclair did that deal, they bragged to their shareholders about how they had not had to use their own cash? At the time, it was a humble brag. <laughs> yeah. Now, David, uh, the, this issue will represent a massive revenue gap for NBA teams, MLB teams, and to a lesser extent, NHL teams. What happens? What happens with this revenue gap? This is going to squeeze payrolls. There's no two ways around it. And owners are not going to start putting more money in from their checking account or reallocating their assets from yachts and Picassos into players. They're just not going to do it. So you're going to see salaries come down, as you should. Because in any business, when revenue is down, expenses start going down. And in, in businesses with a cap where you're expenses are a percentage of your revenue, that's just easy math. A little more difficult than baseball without the salary cap, but you're having teams right now who are absolutely petrified about their revenue and they're being delusional. I've heard that people in Miami are saying, hey, we expect to get the same broadcast revenue that we were gonna get under our TV deal with Bally Sports Florida. And I have a surprise for them. It's a guaranteed no. I would suggest that the NBA will be an exception to that partly because of timing. They're going to do a new deal. Uh, they're going to go from two people paying them lots of money, uh, TNT and ESPN, to three or four people paying them lots of money, and their timing, and again, their national appeal, I don't think their owners will see much of a decline. Do you think that Warner, well, you're also talking national versus, versus local. No, no, I'm talking combined. When you combine all the money they're gonna receive, they will be able to with they they will not see significant shortfalls if the RSNs de, de, decline. I, I happen to agree with you for ba for basketball, but not for baseball. It's too big a percentage of your total revenue pie, your local net broadcast revenue piece of pie, that you can't replace that with increased national deals. How uh, how how big is that slice of pie for most teams? Uh, you're never going to hear numbers from anyone but the Braves, and even those numbers don't believe what you see, even though they're public. Uh, with the Marlins, are TV deal was $18 million that we inherit that we signed in 05 so we could pay Carlos. God, are we idiots. Do you know what we did, John? 
Our owner, I swear to you, this is what he did. Bless his soul. So successful in his art business. In 2005, he said, listen, I want to sign Carlos Delgado. I want to try to win a second World Series. Go to Long Island and there's a company called Cablevision. Tell them you want to sign a new deal, but you want 30 million up front and you don't care what the money is down the road. And I said, but down the road is going to happen really soon. He said, not if we trade everybody. No, he didn't really say that, but we did take the money up front, which you were only too happy to do. And it wasn't you, it was Cablevision. It was the most expensive money you could ever borrow that upfront money. But owners love it because it balances their budget. And then our TV deal was terrible, but let's just say it was $18 million. And then now their current TV deal is $60 million and they get that much in revenue sharing. They get that much in the national revenue that gets allocated to their team. So they're down to, let's say a third, where in our, when we were around, it was closer to 60 or 70%. So 60 to 70% of your revenue is just going. Um, I would say there are certain teams where that is going to be the case. That's astronomical. That is Scary. an extraordinary sum of money. And uh, for, for baseball, real difficult times and one for Rob Manfred to handle. I want to move uh, to another sport. And we actually want to marry two stories that are in the news in, in college football. Uh, one are the public comments and public posturing of the Florida State Athletic Director and President and overall hierarchy about trying to rattle the cage of the ACC because of how little money they are receiving in media rights relative to their competitors in the Big Ten and in the SEC, and what's going on with the Pac-12 right now, who are basically on an island right now looking for someone to give them a decent media rights deal. Uh, and it appears as though right now the front runner is Apple, but we don't know uh, what, what the status of that is. They're, they're very secretive about the way that they negotiate. Uh, Fox and ESPN and the linear channels are not really interested in being big-time investors in the Pac-12. And John Skipper, you might have a solution to both of these problems. I, I might, and I'm not certain that uh, ESPN is not interested in being in the Pac-12 business. I know it's been reported, but I'm not certain that's true. I think that uh, uh, the ACC should expand uh, or should merge with the Pac-12, which now has 10 teams. I would take eight of those teams, change my footprint, have a 24-team conference with a Western division, and their ACC network footprint would expand to the West Coast. You could probably force a renegotiation with ESPN for a new deal, and you could solve both problems. Uh, the ACC would get more money, expand its footprint, could compete with the SEC and the Big Ten. Why Why would the ACC stand to make more money by, by bringing these schools in when the market is kind of telling them that they're not very attractive? The ACC network um, has contracts with all the distributors that pay an in conference fee and pay an out of conference fee based on states and that is not negotiable that is enforceable and suddenly all of those subscribers it's a declining universe there's still 15 million subscribers in that footprint give or take uh and they would suddenly be paying uh a couple of bucks a year for the acc network so and how are you not worried that it's going to go the way of the regional sports networks it Explain is explain to me why acc it, network is not 10 years behind Fox Sports Florida. Um, because it's still in, it's a national channel. It still is watched by most people in the footprint as opposed to 5 or 10%. And because of the clout of ESPN and negotiations. And, and and by the way, just to just to like put a finer point on what you were saying, uh, basically the ACC, the way the ACC network w works is if your state has an ACC school, the cable company has to pay more. So Comcast has to pay $2 for every subscriber, as opposed to in Oklahoma, where there is not an ACC school, they pay 60 cents or whatever the case may be. Correct. All right. So okay. so th th that's the way that model works. But uh, David, you, see, you seem to make a face at the idea that uh, the conference channels are going the way of the Dodo as well. How do you not think that people are going to want a la carte for they, their college football as well as their professional sports? They will, as long as there's a pay TV bundle. It will have as its highest paid member of the bundle, ESPN, and those other networks associated with ESPN are along for the ride. And uh, by the way, they could do another thing. They could kick Florida State out for uh, for whining and uh, because they get paid for Florida by having Miami, and they could go put in Colorado or somebody and get, get more money. If you had to fire everyone for insubordination, you'd be working alone, John. 
<laughs> John, uh, so I, I want to ask you about Florida State uh, attempt, attempting to saber rattle to get uh, more money out of their current deal. They basically want a greater percentage of the overall revenue. They're floating out. Well, here's what it would cost to buy out our portion of the ACC deal. Although, so you you did the ACC deal. Can you explain to us how it works and if if Florida State were to try and buy themselves out of it or try and get a bigger percentage of revenue, what impediments would they meet? They, they have multiple problems. Right. First of all, I don't know whether they have another home. I don't know if the Big Ten or the SEC wants them. The SEC has a Florida school, so they don't get paid more money in the SEC network for bringing in Florida State. They have 16 teams. That's a nice number to have in a conference. The ACC, I, I think it's been reported. I don't know this from my experience or any other way that Florida has about a $30 million a year penalty they'd have to pay for four years to get out. It's $120 million. Second, the rights to the Florida State games, at least in the deal, even if they bought their way out of the conference, remain in the deal until 36. So they could buy themselves out and still not receive revenues from anybody else. To be fair to the— Wait, so, so how does that work? So if ACC bought themselves out of the ACC and went to the Big, or the, the Big Ten, for instance— they would what have what to, would happen to their media rights? They would have to litigate to take their media rights with them because they are in the con. They have given those rights to the ACC through thirty. What would be the likelihood of success of that litigation? I I, I can't speak to that. Yeah. I don't know. It would the, just be money. It's it's a negotiation. Those provisions and deals are not as much to keep schools in jail. They're really to protect the value of the networks, uh, in my opinion, and to make sure sub subscription revenue keeps coming. It, it and is. the way you solve that, it's just a math equation. What Florida adds to that network, the network allocates a certain amount to it. And if you make them whole, then that's the end of that. Yeah. And to give the athletic director at Florida State his due, he's simply trying to get somebody's attention. Like, this is not acceptable. I can't keep my program in the top 10 or 15 if I'm getting $30, $40 million a year less than the University of Florida with whom I'm competing. Uh, he probably knows this is not practical. And I'm not actually sure that the Big Ten or the SEC want to expand further. But Does this but, sound but, but, like small revenue and large revenue, John? Yes. Think about or, what you yeah. just said. No, help me help me understand what I just said. Uh, you, you, you said that... FSU is said with how can I compete with UF with fewer dollars of revenue? Did you, is that what you said or did I miss it? Yeah, no, that's accurate. I so can't. when I'm yelling, how do I compete with the Mets and their $300 million payroll when my payroll is a hundred or when their revenue is 300 million and my revenue is a hundred million? How is that different? It's not different. And so what, how is the way that you keep those type of leagues together? The way baseball stays together, if you don't mind me saying, is we are all franchisees of Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. In college, I don't believe there's anything that ties those binds as closely, which is why I think there's more opportunity for an FSU to actually do something about its problem than there is for the Marlins to do something about their problem. But isn't but isn't it a, ludic a ludicrously expensive problem for Florida State? They're they're signed to a deal for 13 more years. They have to pay out the rights. The the, the ESPN deal was signed through 2037. That's uh, there's 14 more years left on that. And when presumably they signed the deal, Florida State approved it. They were on board. So they it, John, what, what is their recourse here as a school? What can they do to work their way out of this problem? I think it's difficult. And by the way, the suggested recourse that they get paid more money than the other schools, uh, the last time that happened in a Power Five conference, it was in the Big 12 where Texas got more money than anybody else, and that didn't work out very well. You can't do that. That's not going to work. That's actually what they do in England, in the English Premier League, right? They pay more money to the big teams. La, La, La Liga is a good example. So I think yeah. Real Madrid and Barcelona retain a massive percentage. Although I think the Premier League is a bit more even. I think the distribution in the payment is based off where you finish in the league. And so the team in first makes like $20 million more than the team at the bottom. They're still relatively close together. They are, but that does not account for the Champions League. Uh, right. Where the top four teams. Look, the English Premier League is very happy. If they ran the NFL, they would want the Cowboys and the Packers and the New York Giants uh, to win every year. They don't want the Tennessee Titans to win. They don't want the Jacksonville Jaguars to win, and their 
financial payments are actually set up so that that doesn't happen. Every now and then, Lester won a few years ago, and everybody thought that was fun. That's not really what they want. I should point out that baseball does something that may not people don't know about. When you do a national deal, Florida is a great example. What's the name of your ballpark down there? It's not Marlins Park, right? Lone Depot Park. I believe it's called Lone Depot Park. Lone Depot Park, coincidentally, became a sponsor of the ALCS and NLCS. I don't know if you know that, but they they are are Lone Depot. It wasn't Lone Depot Park. It was Lone Depot, but yeah. Right. But part of that deal is that Lone Depot siphoned off money to name Marlins Park. Mm Mm-hmm. So whether people admit that or not, here's another way it works. When MLB does a deal, they just announced a deal with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is taking over the secondary market in baseball. When StubHub had the deal, all 30 teams split evenly the amount in principle of the deal. But part of the deal was an ad spend where StubHub would become a sponsor of teams. We went to StubHub and said, hey, will you buy an outfield sign? And they said, really? Of course not. The Yankees called up StubHub and said, hey, will you buy a sign? And StubHub said, hell yeah, I will, and gave him a million bucks. So there is a way to get revenue to teams, even when you're supposedly splitting revenue. So there are tons of different ways to get it done. I don't think anybody should be allowed to name a stadium before they put it into the national anthem of baseball. Take me out to the seat, geek. Take me out to the Loan Depot. <laughs> just change every lyric just, in the song to a sponsor. It, it doesn't feel that wonderful and pastoral and America's pastime. It should just take be the me Miami out. ballpark then. Take me How about out LeBron the- James playing at Crypto.com? Are we okay with that? Uh, that? That doesn't trip off the tongue either. There is no take me out to the basketball arena, unfortunately. Yeah. And and sometimes baseball are, are beholden to their traditions. I can say this, and John uh, will probably just sit there and, and grin, but uh, Florida State, your problem was John Skipper. <laughs> your, <laughs> your problem was that John Skipper did a damn good deal negotiating the ACC deal that runs through 2037, and you're just trying to figure out your way out of it at this moment. I want to cover one last thing uh, that is sort of it is related to sports business in, in the – uh, perspective of running organizations. Um, the story involving Brandon Miller and the Alabama basketball program and Nate Oates, their head coach, basically insisting on continuing to play Brandon Miller, despite the fact that he was uh, allegedly a, provided the gun that was a murder weapon in a murder case involving another Alabama basketball player. And as uh, either an accessory or, or an accomplice. He has not yet uh, been charged, I don't believe. Uh, and so as such, he is going uh, to continue to play for the basketball team. Uh, David, I think the subject of how criminality is handled by sports organizations has been covered uh, quite substantially. And usually, David, your answer is he keeps playing because that's unfortunately the the way that morality uh, is handled most often in these organizations. How would how are do you think Alabama or how is Alabama handling this in your judgment? And what would most programs do in this in this situation? First, Nate Oates did not have the first and final decision on whether Brandon Miller was playing. So to not implicate the athletic director and the university president and the university Fair. board of trustees is not accurate. In this situation, they were all working in concert to figure out what to do with Brandon Miller. Second, there is some dispute as to whether or not he knew there was a gun in the car, whether or not he knew he was bringing a gun to where a crime was gonna be committed. All of these will come out in trial. He has not been charged and I'm not defending him because I'm anti-gun of all sorts, no question. However, in this case, he's a good player and Alabama's having a good season and it means a lot of money for Alabama to do well in the NCAA tournament and he hasn't been charged yet, so they're gonna let him play. Is it the right or wrong thing to do? I think John Skipper would probably tell you that if any of us, us, by the way, any of you at Metal Arc Media had a problem, (laughs) my guess is that John would quickly cut ties and move along without waiting for the judge and jury to happen. So I hope that John is honest about what he would do for various employees versus others, because certainly he would not put me and you, Witty, in the same category as Levitard. Well, it's... Interesting. By the way, and I'm I'm not suggesting that I understand what went on or what he's guilty of or not guilty of. Um, I do know, uh, I'm trying to sort of think this through. I do know, let's see, the person who allegedly pulled the trigger was not a member of the team. 
So I'm going to suggest that uh, you, David Sampson, called uh, Chris Whittingham, or you called uh, Dan LeBetard, and asked him to bring you a gun to a club at 120. Turns out that Chris Whittingham rode along with him, and he's actually the one who got out of the car and handed you the gun, and somebody was murdered. Um, I don't think the next day Chris Whittingham and Dan LeBetard would be appearing on the radio. Uh, it just feels to me, and it can't be done. I, I don't. I agree with you. It's it's a case where college sports has become so important to the identity of schools. There's so much financial benefit that they can't make what is obviously the right decision. And that is, at the very least, I'm sorry, but Brandon Miller uh, and Darius Miles are not going to play anymore. They, it, it would be interesting to see what Alabama had done if their roles were reversed in this case. It's fortunate for them that the less important player uh, was the one more culpable. But I don't regard that in any circumstance handing a gun, whether you know it's loaded or not, to somebody, driving a car, uh, being an accomplice to delivering that gun to somebody who kills somebody, I wouldn't feel good the next day if I knew that I was just going into the basketball arena and the, that player was on the court and was playing. He hasn't apologized, probably at the appropriate advice of his lawyer. Hasn't shown, as far as I know, any remorse. I didn't, don't think he tried to push the player away who patted him down. So they don't seem that there does not seem to be any particular um, appropriate action by that university to recognize the difficulty of what happened to the family of the victim. By the way, I'm firing Nate Oates for the introduction of uh, of Miller and the pat down. If I'm the athletic director or the president of the university, yeah. that is too much for me. And I don't know if uh, you guys touched on it on your show, and I did not touch on it on mine. But I found that to be abhorrent. Did they and the suspect fact that he'd been doing it the whole season makes no difference to me. I don't like running a business where anyone in my business is tone deaf. I think that's a very important skill to have when you're running a business. And that introduction where he gets patted down, to me, that's tone deaf. Seems to speak to me to a culture where I don't think anybody is concerned about anything other than the historic opportunity to make a long run into the NCAA tournament. And <laughs> and, and also, I mean, in Brandon That's Miller's true. case, in some mock drafts, he's the third pick in the draft. So I think everyone is sort of incentivized uh, to keep everyone on the court. Uh, this is uh, an, another great conversation, guys. Uh, da David Sampson, again, check out Nothing Personal wherever you get your podcast. John Skipper, the CEO of Metal Arc Media. Thank you, as always, gentlemen.